We interviewed Bobby Ratliff in Corinth, Mississippi in November 2013. Most of our interviews that week were recorded at the County Genealogical Society inside the courthouse. But Mr. Ratliff volunteers during the day at the Eason Outreach Foundation. This interview took place in the former Eason High School, and we hope you enjoy meeting Mr. Ratliff as much as we did. Tell me about your family. How far back do you trace your family? Well, my dad uh, came from Ripley. My mother came from a little area called Kasu. It's kind of out southwest of here. Uh, and my mother was a walker, uh, the daughter of uh, Lane and Lane Walker and uh, Katie Walker. Uh, my father is from Ripley. He was related to the Coxes. Uh, his mother was a Cox and the father was a Ratliff. And as far back as I know that they was raised somewhere around the uh, cotton plant area. Down south of here? The south of Ripley uh, on Highway 15, I think, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you can you trace or are there family stories going back to the Civil War and slavery at the time? No, I can't go that far back now. And your parents, uh, tell me about them. What, what did your father do? What did your parents my, do? My father was a minister. Okay. Because he did, uh, back at that time, uh, he did finish eighth grade. Uh, mm -hmm. And that was very rare, you know. Uh, and, but my mother had very little schooling. Uh, she probably got to maybe fourth, fifth grade, something of that nature. Okay. Uh, and don't know, I think she was, he was like, I think she was either 23 uh, years old when she married. I can remember she told us that. And I think she was about three years older than my dad. And so. And were your dad a minister here? Well, no, he was living at the time, he was in Tupelo. He was pastoring in the Tupelo area. Okay. Uh, my mother had passed in 76. Mm -hmm. And he was pastored all over the Tupelo area down there. And matter of fact, my father was killed. Uh, a neighbor of his, a son's neighbor of his, I don't know my dad, he was always, trying to help people, mm -hmm. and I think in that Samson maybe have had let that young man have money in once upon a time, mm -hmm. and uh, knowing my dad, if he come back and tried to borrow more, he didn't let him have it, mm -hmm. and uh, he was hit from behind with a tattoo. My dad was in, in very good health, mm -hmm. I mean, he didn't get around like a an old man, you know, he wasn't humped over or anything, and he was still pastoring a church in Tupelo called Red Oak Hill. Where did you go to school? I went to school here from, uh, I started school in Tennessee, okay. just uh, across the line uh, in the St. Rest guys area. Yeah, it was the first season that the school opened. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, I finished here uh, 12th grade. So you went through 12th grade here? We went through 12th grade here. My first job after school was at the current high school as a janitor. Okay. Uh, worked there for about four years. And during that time, the plants had started coming south, the manufacturing. And so I was uh, able to get on at Intex. What did you do for them? Well, I started there, which back then uh, you would only be hired in as a custodian. Okay. So we uh, I hired in there and worked as a custodian for maybe about three or four years. The union was voted in and uh, they had to put some lights in production at the time. Okay. So I was one of the ones that was chosen. We went in and took a test. Uh, 
me, uh, my friend, a friend of mine, and myself. His name was Don Wallace. I went in one week and started on the mill. I was a mill operator when I first started. Okay. And he came in the next week as a wind-up operator. Worked third shift. Uh, gave us a pretty rough time, but we've had a rough time most of our lives, so we, we fought through it. Uh -huh. And after that, things uh, mellowed uh, down for us. He stayed on his job, but after a couple of years, I moved up then as a relief man. This is a person that uh, he trained to relieve everybody on that machine. And that was the operator wind up in Banbury at that time. And uh, I got that job and I worked it, I guess, for a couple of years. And then a calendar operator job came open because I was aggressive to do all uh, everything on the job. Okay. And Back so, a moment to the union. Okay. Uh, how would you view their role as far as opening up jobs for blacks here in, in Mississippi? I think it played uh, a big role in it because it was unionized. Mm -hmm. And I think you had to hire a certain percent of blacks there. By union contract? Yes, by union contract. If you're going to be, you couldn't. Okay. They, uh, I think, uh, specified a certain amount that mm -hmm. you had to hire in. Okay. So that. Uh, I ended up going back to Intex. Okay. They hired me back in as a supervisor. Okay. Uh, having uh, my experience, you know, being there. Mm -hmm. And I worked there, I guess, for another 20 years, I think. Right. Okay. As a supervisor. And then retired from there? Yes. Tell me about this and what you do. Well, when I first started, um, we started, I don't know, about four, five years ago, I guess, when it, we first had an idea. We were sitting down talking uh, at the Black History Museum down mm -hmm. there, uh, Ms. Miller and a few others. And we were sitting there, and she was saying, well, it would be so nice if uh, when they close that building down that we could get it and uh, start a community center or something mm -hmm. like that. Uh, maybe move the uh, Black History Museum into it, uh, something like that. Sure. And that's how it started. And they worked for a couple of years and really never got it off its feet. Mm -hmm. It was just brainstorming here, brainstorming there. And, but it was never anything done until uh, they asked Mr. Creighton uh, to uh, come in and uh, be the chairman. Okay. And uh, he started things moving. Okay. And, uh, now, are you still active with the Black History Museum? Yes, I am. Okay. Uh, I have some kind of naive outsider questions for you, if it's okay. Okay. Um, your generation, which is my generation, yes. uh, lived here. You lived here mm -hmm. in, a, in a very segregated world. Yes. <laughs> you went to segregated schools the yes. whole period of school. Yes. Uh, segregated community. Mm -hmm. Younger people today, mm -hmm. uh, if that's discussed, how is that understood? Well, I'm going to say that some that well, let me, let me give this uh, a second here. And uh, I don't want to uh, misrepresent anything. I think why they see it different uh, is because they came up in a different uh, generation. Mm -hmm. And the generations changed. Now, my idea of what they are doing now, they're not taking advantage being a black person. Mm -hmm. They're not taking advantage of that situation. See, and it might be because they don't know what my generation went through, mm -hmm. 
to try to get to a certain point, uh, to get them where they are now, that they fail to see this. And I think my generation wanting them to do more, to take more advantage of it, and they fail to do that, uh, take advantage of, like, see, when uh, I got in at the plant, that was the best thing in the world for me. Sure. See, and I tried to give mine the advantages to go to school that I never had. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the young kids now, I think every year, uh, the foundation that they're setting for their children, most of them, um, I'm gonna say a majority, sure. they're not setting a good foundation. Okay. Uh, and this is why the kids are not taking it serious. You can't take a three-year-old child and just laugh at things he do. You've got to train him from the time he start understanding of when you make him understand mm -hmm. the things that he should know and should not do and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, up, because you can't wait and start training when you get 10 or 12. Sure. They, they don't know how to parent their children. Uh, that's one of the things. and it's, this is one of the things that we're looking at here. If we, it's not the children that we need to get to, it's that seem like lost generation in between there mm -hmm. that uh, needs to be on the right track. Looking back on that time now, um, how do you feel about that? I mean, is there still anger about what it was like here in the 1950s and 60s? Well, I think, what I feel is the only thing. Uh, sure. You can't say that it's, you'll always remember certain things, mm -hmm. but uh, if you're gonna look at the whole, at the big picture, you can't hold on to that. Uh, I look at it today, if you treat me as a man, I'll treat you the same thing. And that's, that's the only way. You can't hold those things back, but you can never forget them. Mm -hmm. But you have, to, uh, you have to let them go to a degree to move ahead. You were a relatively young man. Um, there was a great deal of disturbance here in the state of Mississippi, certain mm -hmm. med drivers and the integration of University mm -hmm. of Ole Miss. Um, do you remember much of that related to here in Corinth? Was that for the South? We did have some, a few marches, but it was nothing on this end like it was farther south. Uh -huh. And I, and who I give the credit for there, I think is our leaders, now we, I'll have to look at uh, our principal at that time, mm -hmm. Mr. Bishop. Yeah. Mr. Bishop was, I don't know how you, he was an extraordinary man. Mm -hmm. He was a communicator. Uh, he, if you sit and listen to him, he could talk you into anything and he made sense. Mm -hmm. See, that's it. He, uh, if you sit down and listen to him, he could uh, convince you that he was right, and he, he could was, show that to you. Was the, he was what, school board chairman or something? Well, actually he was principal. They didn't want him to be superintendent. They had a system here one time. If you were the oldest principal, then you could uh, be superintendent. So they didn't want a black or superintendent. Mm -hmm. So they changed the system then when they integrated. They made him Tile One program, Tile, you know, the Tile One program. Uh -huh. And he was a lobbyist, what a lot of the young people didn't know all over around Kyrian, that he was one of the lobbyists from Alcoin County. If they wanted money, they sent Mr. Bishop. And he ultimately got elected mayor. Yes, uh, he ran for 
uh, Alderman the first year, time he ran, he lost. And then he came back and won. And I think in doing that time, I don't know what it was, the second term, I think, we had problems in the mayor's office. And they made him uh, mayor pro tem or something until they, and he held that position until next election he ran and he won it. And he stayed there until, I think. He won uh, yes. essentially re-election yes. in a mostly white town. Yes. Okay. See, I, I think the generation of white that when he was in there, they didn't know that he, they, they were just coming into the political field. Okay. Uh, they didn't know how uh, the things that he had done for Alcorn County, uh -huh. as far as lobbying. Because I think back when John D. Messier was, uh, was mayor is when he started doing this. And there was a story in which I find it was true, like when he came here in 1936, sometime between 36 and I'm gonna say 44, 45, and they had the Scale Street building up there. Okay. He needed furniture for two rooms and library furniture. And the way they did it then, they would order it to high school and you would get the old furniture and they would get the new furniture. Wonderful. And, but, he came in and uh, so what he did, he got a requisition and made it out and sent it to the state of Mississippi, mm -hmm. Scale Street uh, Elementary and Scale Street High School or whatever. And uh, months later, here come the furniture, mm -hmm. <laughs> to Scale Street, and they sent the bill to the high school. And boy, that was a uh, <laughs> there was a big rigmarole there, but hey, what could he do? And it specified mm -hmm. where the furniture should go. He must have been a very persuasive he, man. He was. He was a very intelligent, smart, and persuasive person. And that's what parents did back then, uh -huh. because they had to. Sure. Yeah. They trained you how to do things. They taught you how to get along in life. They taught you what the systems were mm -hmm. and how things were in the streets and, and that. So you uh, learn how to avoid certain issues because you were taught that. Including racial issues. Yes. Okay. Uh, say, for instance, if I was going down the street and I was on the same side that you had a group of white guys down on the corner, I cross over the street to the other side because you know what they're going to do. Mm -hmm. or they're going to call you the N-word. So why walk down in the middle of them when you can go over? Not that you're afraid, but that's the wise thing to do. You can't lose. You, you can't win if you go down there and get in the middle of them. They're going to push you. They're going to do something to you. So if you cross over the street and you can go on, See, and this is the sport of You were taught this because you can't win the system. Uh, if something happened, police come, it's going to take you to jail. See, so we were taught all this. Kids now that come up, they're not taught anything, basically, if they're real young. And they grow up with a chip on the shoulder, too. Mm -hmm. See? Say the man's holding me down. If you want to be something, it's all up here. Mm -hmm. You might have to take a little, little abuse, verbal abuse, but uh, if you really want to do it, and you're programmed here to do it, and you're going to do what you have to do to do this, to accomplish, you have to set yourself a goal. Sure. And you can reach it. Are you optimistic about this project here? Yes. Good. Oh, man. It's, it's, I believe it's going to happen.
That's an optimistic. That's an optimistic approach. Yes. That's a good thing. It's going to happen.